Welcome to the uh, Arctic Research Seminar Series, and welcome to the uh, DC office of the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. My name is Bob Rich, and I'm Executive Director of Arcus. Thank you so much for coming out today. Arcus has been working for more than 25 years to connect Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration. We're a nonprofit organization, a consortium of organizations and individuals interested in advancing inquiry, discovery, and understanding in this important region and informing sound decision making. This seminar series is designed to provide unique dialogue between some of the leading Arctic researchers with federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. For those of you in the room here, I'd encourage you to take a look through the Arcus materials you were handed when you arrived. You should have received a seminar evaluation, which we'd like you to return at the registration desk after the seminar, information about Arcus and some of the services we offer to the research community, as well as information about Arcus membership. Afterwards, I'd be happy to discuss any questions that you have and would love to hear how we can best help you to succeed. We're currently joined by something like 80 participants online uh, from throughout the US as well as uh, other countries including Canada, France, Norway, and Sweden, in addition to about 20 here in Washington, DC. For those of you on the webinar, you can use the chat box to communicate with the Arcus webinar hosts. You also have the opportunity to submit questions for Mark by typing them into the questions pane at the bottom of your screen. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session after his talk. Whether you're here or online, I'd like to invite each of you personally to become an Arcus member. Currently, all types of organizations are eligible to become Arcus members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the importance of Arctic research can become an Arcus member. I invite you to join us. You can join online at www.arcus.org, or if you're here in DC, I can take your membership application after the seminar. I'd also like to acknowledge our partners in this seminar series, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space. Thank you also to the Polar Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine for their assistance with registration. Of course, I also want to thank the uh, National Science Foundation Division of Polar Programs for major, major financial support to Arcus, including much of what we do in this seminar series in particular. Now it's my pleasure to int introduce our speaker. Mark Brzezinski has a long and distinguished resume of public service and leadership, which I'll just highlight here because I know you want to hear from him rather than just from me. He received his undergraduate degree at Dartmouth College, law degree at University of Virginia, and a doctorate in political science from Oxford University. He was a Fulbright Scholar in Warsaw, Poland between 91 and 93. He served on the National Security Council staff under President Clinton between 1999 and 2001, first as Director for Russia and Eurasia, then as Director for the Balkans. He was a partner at the Washington DC law firm, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mark was U.S. Ambassador to Sweden during the 2011-2015 period, working closely with the Swedish government during its chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which the United States now chairs. Mark made the Arctic a central focus of his tenure in Sweden, and he currently serves as Executive Director of the U.S. government's Arctic Executive Steering Committee. This committee was established by Presidential Executive Order in 2015 to enhance coordination of national efforts in the Arctic and oversee the national strategy for the Arctic region. The committee is chaired by Presidential Science Advisor Dr. John Holdren. Without a doubt, Mark has been an enthusiastic supporter of Arctic research and its important role in guiding policymaking. He's one of our strongest allies as we seek to make connections across boundaries and advance our understanding of this vital and rapidly changing region. Mark will tell us today about the activities of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee and an exciting unprecedented summit on Arctic science issues which was recently announced. Please join me in welcoming to the Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series, Ambassador Mark Brzezinski. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to turn on my microphone here. 
and start by saying, first of all, to Bob, thank you. Thank you to the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States and begin by saying that this is a special Arctic moment, especially if you are an Arctic scientist or researcher. On the one hand, the great challenges are increasingly evident and visible. 2016 is breaking all records, but then again, so did 2015 and 2014 before that. We are just beginning to understand the global linkages and impacts of what is happening in the Arctic, as well as the local impacts. Two days ago, I welcomed to the White House the Tribal Council of Point Lay in northern Alaskan, in northern Alaska, a subsistence community that more than most has bared, has bared witness to how ecosystems are completely being changed by the impacts of climate change and provide direct testimonials about how those implicate their life and their societies. And they, more than most, can tell you that our world may be, in their case, one indigenous society fewer unless something is done to somehow mitigate what is happening. The Arctic is more visible and central today in policymaking. Just take a look. We're in Washington right now for the online audience. Take a look at the Washington think tank community. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for the Arctic Research Consortiums of the United States long-term continuity in terms of focus on the Arctic issue. But today, the Council on Foreign Relations is just unveiling a new task force on US policy to, on the Arctic. The Woodrow Wilson Center, Heritage, Brookings, the Center for American Progress, more. All are developing or have already developed special programs focusing on the Arctic. And that's good, because what you see germinated as ideas in think tanks a following year or sometime later can actually become policy. We're seeing increasing mass media focus on the Arctic, whether by high visibility celebrities, Alexander Skarsgård, Leonardo DiCaprio, drawing attention. And that's important, because if the Arctic issue remains esoteric and extraneous, less can be done in terms of the resources of government and governments around the world. The number of scholarly articles are increasing multifold every year now. Just do a comparison on an online search from between 2010 and now in the United States and around the world. And the Obama administration is seizing every opportunity to make a difference on the Arctic issue in this final, final year of the administration. The president is personally interested in the Arctic, and he's personally interested out of a, a sense of responsibility for the future. And the self-interest in this is obvious, and we all share it. It's the self-interest of our children and their children and the world that they inherit. So let me provide a context before I talk specifically about what Bob referred to, and that's this first ever White House Arctic Science Ministerial, a broader context in terms of what the Obama administration has underway, and then zero in on that capstone event, and what we hope is a game-changing event for Arctic science in September of this year. The president created by executive order in January of 2015 a brand new government platform out of the White House. It's both domestic and international because the Arctic issue is obviously domestic and international. The Arctic is everything. It's native and tribal, it's health, it's shipping and maritime, it's state local, it's energy. And the president felt that our 
policy approach was too fragmented among the multiple agencies and departments that have been investing millions of dollars on the Arctic issue over the years. And so to create essentially a unity of purpose within your government and a shared sense of the challenge and a shared sense of the opportunity, the president created this brand new government platform con consisting of about 25 federal agencies um, around the federal family ranging from Department of Interior and Energy to DOD to the State Department to the DNI um, and the EPA and so forth, and including many offices within the executive office of the president, including the Council for Environmental Quality, the National Security Council, um, and so forth. Um, the president could have easily put the Arctic Executive Steering Committee as a White House platform under the umbrella of the National Security Council, given the security and domain implications of the Arctic. He could have easily put it under the National Economic Council, given the commercial implications of the resources and shipping question in the Arctic. He chose to put it under the Office of Science and Technology Policy and under the chairmanship of Dr. Holdren because of the centrality in the foundation of the Arctic issue of science and a scientific understanding of what is happening there and what it is that we can do. The vice chair is Amy Pope. The committee is also supported by Alaskans, Tommy Boudreau, Fran Ulmer, Beth Kurtula. Um, and what I can report to you that this combination, especially under the chairmanship of John Holdren, who himself has developed over the years a focus on Alaska and the Arctic, has produced a number of catalytic different opportunities and developments on the Arctic, which I will report out to you. The first thing that the Arctic Executive Steering Committee did as soon, it was, as, soon as it was created was to respond immediately to the president's interest to go to the Arctic himself. Actually, really shocked to learn that President Obama is the first sitting American president to visit the Arctic, um, given Alaska, and, uh, and yet he is. And why was that important? Because it's an opportunity to bear witness to what's happening in the Arctic and to communicate it. Where the president goes, the eyes of the world go. And that's important because the scientific implications of the Arctic issue are not easy to communicate and not easy to widely popularize and publicize. And that is essential in this democracy of ours where if people don't know about something, or not informed about an issue, and if we do not use the bully pulpit of the White House to share information about a decision question, they are more than likely to remain stalled um, and uh, less likely to be acted upon. And so, bringing to the president, bringing the president to the Arctic, was a value unto itself on the challenge of communicating the Arctic issue. But it was also important as it pertains to the higher meaning why President Obama went to the Arctic. The President went to the Arctic because for him the looming crisis in the Arctic is a tangible preview of the looming crisis of the global condition. It's an augury. It's a foreshadow. It's a preview of what generations to come will experience if we don't get in front of whether it's the adaptation and resilience questions, if we don't get in front of the forecasting and better forecasting as it pertains to science and the like. So that was the first thing that we zeroed in on. And the President went to the Arctic for three days in September. That is expensive real estate on a presidential calendar in early September just after a financial hiccup with the goings-on 
elsewhere in the world, whether it's Syria or in Asia and elsewhere. But we were able to focus the world, at least for those three days, on what is happening in the Arctic and why it should be important to you. And we've tried to build on that visit since then. The, um, the, the Arctic Executive Steering Committee then got underway with the goals for which it was created. The steering committee was created to set priorities based on the president's vision. It was created to evaluate progress on those priorities. It was created to support the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And it was created to advance engagement between international, federal, local, and tribal. Let me touch upon each of those. On the evaluation piece, a very good example of that is what happened immediately after the president visited Alaska. And for President Obama, evaluation and assessment on progress, once announcements and promises and commitments are made, are a really important piece of his leadership at the White House. And so as soon as we got back from Alaska, I created a spreadsheet to capture each one of the more than 40 commitments and promises the president announced while in Alaska. While the president was in Alaska, three packages of quote unquote deliverables were announced while he was there. Some were high visibility, the icebreaker, the Denali Commission, the renaming of Mount Denali. But underneath those were all kinds of grant programs pertaining to infrastructure, of fellowship programs, exchanges, and so forth. And marking progress and milestones and reporting them out is a key piece of what the Arctic Executive Steering Committee needs to do. And so that's exactly what we did. And after the president visited, we used the next few months to really generate outcomes from the interagency progress, um, of process, whether it's EPA water and sanitation grants, which have been fully funded in Alaska, or USDA high energy cost grants. Um, we've also produced a 2016 implementation plan report for the national strategy of the Arctic region that captures all the follow-on milestones from those commitments made while the president was in Alaska, but also preceding those under the rubric of the national strategy for the Arctic region. And I believe that implementation plan report, a copy of it is out in the lobby. And this is a unique implementation plan report in the sense that it reports milestones and progress in 2015 and before, but it also captures all the commitments and promises looking forward, um, including the promises uh, pertaining to icebreakers, um, things that have to be funded uh, by uh, Congress. On the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, that has been spearheaded by the State Department, and we are incredibly proud of the results and consensus that particularly Admiral Papp, our special representative for the Arctic region at the State Department, has spearheaded. He really has, whether it's the science and cooperation agreement that is being negotiated and getting close to finalized um, under the Arctic Council, and in many other areas, really has achieved measurable results and markers. On the engagement piece, I can tell you that we have really gone out of our way to do outreach in Alaska and to bring Alaskans here to the White House to listen and learn to the native and tribal community, to the business community, to state and local officials. Governor Walker, uh, and this was captured on YouTube, um, when he visited the White House during the National Governors Association meeting in March, reflected to the president directly that and even though there are political differences between the, the, the dominant political construct in Alaska and this administration, he said that there has not been a more healthy and respectful and interactive relationship between an a executive branch in the federal government and the state capital in terms of the governor's office in modern memory. And we really took that as a high praise coming from him. 
looking to the future in Washington money walks. As, as people can talk the talk, but it's money that walks. And our US budget proposal for 2017 reflects a national imperative on the Arctic issue like never before. The national budget proposal that was rolled out at the beginning of February has symbolically Mount Denali on its cover, but much more importantly, between its pages, a commitment to pursue $150 million to fund what it takes to build an icebreaker. $2 billion for resilience as a national challenge, $400 million of which is dedicated for Alaska. The Denali Commission identified as the appropriate vehicle for coordination between federal, state, local, and tribal on the resilience and adaptation and even relocation issue. I believe yesterday HUD announced $9 million for new talk um, in Alaska as it pertains to resilience and a national commitment to fund Arctic science through the National Science Foundation. And so in that sense, the Arctic Executive Steering Committee is pursuing its mandate as it's provided for in the executive order. But we're also seizing other opportunities coming down the pike that weren't necessarily anticipated two years ago when the Arctic Executive Steering Committee was created, but provide important opportunities to do something catalytic um, and game-changing on the Arctic. Take, for example, what we've seen in the last 90 days here in Washington, when we have welcomed for state visits six of the eight Arctic countries, Canada's new Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and the five Nordic leaders. And we seize those opportunities to negotiate with them in advance a commitment that future commercial activity will be consistent with climate and sustainability and environmental standards. That is a huge step. And we would love to have, we, we welcome other countries to join us, to join in this commitment, and to see whether we can create a common global approach when it comes to what is appropriate commercial activity in the Arctic in the future. But as I said earlier, Arctic science has had primacy in terms of this president's vision on the Arctic. And we wanted to do something game-changing on, on, on Arctic science in this last year of this administration. And to do something that captures the full potential of alignment between governments in a way that despite great Arctic science being conducted now and the great work of the Arctic Council maybe isn't fully reaching that potential. We highlighted this during the state visit of Justin Trudeau, Canadian Prime Minister, and last Friday the White House announced that on September 28th the White House will host the first ever Arctic Science Ministerial. Never before has there been a meeting of science ministers from around the world on the Arctic issue. When I was in Sweden during the Swedish chairmanship of the Arctic Council, the Swedes held a highly effective environmental ministerial on the Arctic, and they brought in environment ministers, and that was an important, an important alignment in that regard. But there never has been a meeting of science ministers from around the world um, on, um, on Arctic science. And Dr. Holdren, the president's science advisor, has taken a very open-minded approach to this. What we're not doing is saying, we're hosting this ministerial. Here are our deliverables. Please come and join us on those. Instead, what Dr. Holdren has required is that we approach the countries that we are inviting. And we're inviting, of course, all eight Arctic countries, but also countries from around the world that have a significant stake on the Arctic issue, whether Korea or Japan or Poland or Italy or the EU, um, Australia, among a number of others. And we've invited them to send ideas and proposals uh, for international combinations under the four themes that are captured 
in the blog post that Dr. Holdren did on the White House blog um, announcing this particular ministerial. And that blog post captures those four themes, and I'll simply recite them. First, Arctic science challenges and their regional and global implications. Second, pertaining to Arctic observation and monitoring and data sharing, strengthening and integrating those initiatives. Third, applying expanded scientific understanding of Arctic to build regional resilience and to shape global responses. And then fourth, Arctic science as a vehicle for STEM and STEM education and citizen empowerment. Because, the, because Arctic science can capture so much, we felt that we had to limit the work that we tried to align with governments around the world to, uh, to those pr to particular themes. And Dr. Holdren zeroed in on those on the basis of each of their scientific urgency, but also on the basis of the potential of what it is we can do together in the short term with other governments around the world. And we have reached out to within the federal family, and we have gotten many proposals from the federal agencies and even from NGOs and from universities regarding combinations and proposals. And we're going to be taking combinations and proposals on board up to and through the ministerial, because this will be a working ministerial with people around the table, much like you're sitting around the table right here, hopefully building combinations that have not been done before to see what it is that we can do on permafrost, to see what it is we can do on observing and monitoring in areas that we don't currently observe and monitor, to see what we can do on education for the people of the Arctic, given the technology resources and the way people communicate today. Um, and so that is the opportunity. The process by which we're going to pursue this, and Martin Jeffries, Dr. Martin Jeffries, who recently joined the White House staff, Office of Science and Technology and Policy, is teamed up with Dr. Jeremy Mathis to really broker the combinations between the different proposals that we've received. And it's in certain ways, if I can describe it just by metaphor, it's a little bit like putting together a jigsaw puzzle um, of proposals that we've received from Canada, or from Sweden, or from Russia, which will take part in this ministerial, or from China and Asia. Bringing together and cobbling together a range of engagement and a range of expense reflected and offered up by these particular proposals from around the US government, from around the NGO community, and from around the international community. So it's an open-minded approach. It's risky. We need your help in terms of advancing ideas and supporting the concept and sharing how this has benefits to the scientific interest, the American interest, and I really am hopeful that we cobble together before the ministerial announcements and combinations that we can, we can share um, with the global community at the ministerial, that we will use the day of the ministerial itself to work every possibility between the government ministers who will be the primary participants of the ministerial in the room. We, of course, will have native stakeholders represented as well. This totally fits into the global approach of the president that I work for. When President Obama ran for public office, he ran on the basis of remaking America's role in the world with a view that it really will take a global approach to solve the challenges of our time. And that global approach is manifested in lots of different um, international and foreign policy areas that I won't get into, but it's absolutely manifested in the, in the science, in the environmental, in the technology um, opportunities and challenges that we have as it pertains to the Arctic and the link between the Arctic and the rest of the world. And so I really wanted, I was, I was really appreciative when Bob gave me the offer to 
address you today because it gave me it, I, I, it gives me the opportunity to really make a clarion call to please support us as we pursue specific actions as it pertains to Arctic science, joint ones not just by the United States. The Arctic Science Ministerial is really an acknowledgement that we face a historically unique challenge as it pertains to the Ar Arctic, an opportunity to come together, whether it's on data collection or on observation. We want, through this ministerial and through the work leading up to this ministerial and to the follow-on after the ministerial, to create platforms for dealing with the future that others can share in and join in. And I'll close simply by saying I feel that the Arctic is one of those classical issues that we can all botch up if we don't work together. The Arctic issue is of a scale, it's of an expense that no one country can do alone. But if we work together with other countries, our children will benefit. And so in that way, the Arctic doesn't really reflect the danger lurking in the, in the future, but also an opening for a collective response, therefore an effective response. That's why we're pursuing the Arctic Science Ministerial. We need your help. I'm looking forward to getting your questions. Thank you very much. So uh, what questions do we have in the room or online? Feel free to enter, enter them in the questions box. Uh, yes, in the room. Go right ahead. And uh, please say your name and your organization. I'm Linda Preby. I'm a lawyer at Culhane Meadows. I do technology and Arctic compliance work. Um, I noted when the executive order came out for the steering committee that it included one non-federal position. Um, I haven't been able to determine to what extent that position was filled. Has it been? And do you know by whom? I am not, uh, there is no non-federal position as it pertains to the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. Are you talking about the Denali Commission's new role? No, it's, okay. it is, it's expressed in the executive order okay. that there was discretion for the committee to include one uh, non-federal member, but I've never been able to discern to what extent it was actually filled. Okay. So maybe it hasn't I will, but I But I will say this, because I think what you touch upon is an opportunity to bring others into the Arctic issue and Arctic policy making from outside the federal family. And I think a good reflection of how we're trying to do that is from the Arctic Executive Steering Committee principles meeting that we had yesterday. So yesterday, with John Holdren chairing, we were able to hold at the White House, around a table not too different from this, one of our full principles meetings with deputy cabinet secretaries from the 25 agencies on the Arctic issue. And our very first part of our meeting yesterday was a presentation to the Arctic Executive Steering Committee by Craig Fleener, the, the governor of Alaska's Arctic policy advisor, to share the governor's perspective on how and where we're syncing up, where we're not syncing up, and how we can do more together. As Alaska's economy is impacted by the drop of energy prices, as we pursue diversification, of the Alaskan economy, including, the, including in the Arctic area, after the pull out of Shell, and after many of the local communities align their economies with Shell drilling, what is it that we can do together? Um, there are, as I said in my presentation, a number of Alaskans working within the federal government on the committee. But the committee really, when we have those committee meetings, it really is an opportunity for the federal family to brainstorm on search and rescue, resilience in the Denali Commission. We're at the midpoint of our chairmanship. What are we going to do with the second half of our chairmanship of the Arctic Council? What's gone right? What could we do better? What are agency reports like the, the um, CMTS, IARPIC, um, and DHS and its work planning for crystal serenity and so forth um, to kind of compare notes? Thank you. Um, I have a question online from uh, Dr. Ted Schur of uh, Northern Arizona University. It says, uh, there was a description of the upcoming process to merge submissions put forward for the Arctic Science Ministerial. Is there a mechanism for stakeholders or submitters to participate in the, quote, cobbling together process? Yes. One of the things that I'm really proud that we've been able to do was to create an Arctic Executive Steering Committee website. You know. 
in, 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 the, in the days after the problems of a couple of years ago, um, to create a new White House website is almost mission impossible. But we were able to do this with the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And please go to that website. Um, and if you just type the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, it'll take you to it. Because we will have a page that updates everyone on the ministerial. Um, we plan to put out a particular call to everyone who's interested in submitting an idea or proposal or being involved in some in, in a way. We are interested in creative ideas, innovative approaches, because this is a brand new thing that we're doing. We're trying to use science diplomacy and not prepackage it and then kind of have the day of the ministerial just have a show of what we've done. We're literally trying to use you know, it's almost like the way I would describe it, having worked at a law firm in the past. It's a little bit like what you would see people who cobble together agreements and who serve as a catalyst for an agreement. We're trying to pull together the different parties, see which ideas are the most catalytic for a positive and responsible way forward in terms of Arctic science, and then to paper that agreement in a way that's binding and in a way that transcends the Obama administration. Because we are almost done, and we want what we do to last into the future. So the Arctic Executive Steering Committee website is the place to go for, um, and the, the page for the ministerial on that website. Thank you. Um, in the room, any other questions back there? Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, Kathy Crane from the University of Hawaii. Um, thank you very much for this presentation, I, re I do really appreciate it. I'm wondering if you have some goals for outcomes from the September ministerial that would include some kinds of practical um, methodologies um, by which the countries will be able to work together. Will there be, you hope, maybe a binding agreements at some point in the future, legally binding agreements? That might match up with this new science uh, cooperation agreement that is being pushed through the Arctic Council. And uh, so I would like to know your, your impressions about the possibilities for those outcomes. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for coming today uh, as well. I think a very good example of one area among many areas that we are looking for tangible opportunities pertaining to processes and methodology pertains to data sharing um, on the Arctic. Data sharing on the Arctic issue is too anecdotal right now. It is not yet genuinely pan-Arctic. Um, in certain ways, you know, the Arctic is a strategic space, much like space and much like cyberspace. And if you take a look at our space program 30 years ago, it was truly a national and rather secretive program. And today we have an international space station in which we're pooling resources and bringing people together, literally living in space together like never, ever before. In certain ways, that may be the way the Arctic issue evolves over time, given how expensive and the extent and scale of the Arctic issue may evolve in the future. But at this moment, what we're trying to do is to create a platform that creates efficiencies and alignments. For example, in the area of data sharing, but also in the area of STEM and education and observing and to see how we can pool resources. And it's been very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, to see who has stepped up early in terms of the countries that have been invited to participate. There really have been a few countries that have immediately, everyone, John Holdren, when he's briefed this out to all these different governments, and he started doing that at the COP21 even before this was formally announced, received universal um, embrace from governments around the world about doing this, and not just Arctic governments, but Japan, India, um, Korea, and so forth, that this is a good idea. And we could see the enthusiasm in certain ways being reinforced by the participation of other non-Arctic countries. But in the course prior to the announcement, but when the buzz was getting out about the ministerial, particularly after the Trudeau visit, and Nichelle Le Pen from the Canadian Embassy is here, she was catalytic to a home-run agreement between the US and Canada on the Arctic during that state visit. 
but particularly after the ministerial was announced after, or during the Trudeau state visit, we've seen some governments and some ministries around the world reflect a interest and a participation and an activism that makes them highly likely um, uh, participants in terms of a really important combination on Arctic science looking to the future. Um, and so I'm hopeful. Um, this is expensive stuff, working on the Arctic. Um, it's 10 times as expensive to work there than anywhere else in the world. Um, uh, it is, this is not an Arctic Council event, per se. We want this to be broader than that. We want this to be more inclusive of that, because that's the potential of the Arctic issue at this moment, as others reflect some have some countries have a more distinctive um, focus and interest on the Arctic. Some have more generalized, generalized interest and focus on the Arctic, but want to be involved and want to be involved constructively. That's who we're hoping to pull together in a way that's, again, that aligns governments around the world. This is not a general conference on the Arctic. I can tell you that. This is a working ministerial that, as John Holdren has required, we will work through the ministerial. And then at the end, there will be a joint statement reflecting probably a historical sense of direction as it pertains to the Arctic and a responsible way forward. And what we would love is that joint statement or joint communique, um, which won't be very long, quite frankly, but will be um, in, um, uh, evocative and visionary we want that joint statement or declaration to point to fact sheets that specifically iterate combinations that are different than is what is happening or which advance what is happening today. And not just with governments, but with the private sector. Um, we've received, very interestingly, some really great private sector explorations to how can they take part in it, um, how can they be a good global citizen as it pertains to the Arctic, um, also from the NGOs. Um, and so, again, we are not going to be able to do this alone. It's going to take a collective approach. That's the opportunity of the ministerial. And that's our hope. Okay, so I've got a number of questions online here. Uh, one of them is from uh, James Gamble of the Aleut International Organization. Uh, it says, uh, given the recognized importance of combining indigenous knowledge with science to really understand the Arctic, how will indigenous representatives be included in the Arctic Science Ministerial? And, and thanks very much for that question. As I said in my presentation, absolutely native stakeholders will be brought to the table during the ministerial. We really wanted to do this ministerial at the White House, to be perfectly frank. I explored the Reagan Building and other spaces around Washington. But Dr. Holdren said he wants this ministerial to reflect the personal interest and the enthusiasm of the president. And I spoke to the president last Friday, and he was absolutely enthusiastic about the White House Arctic Science Ministerial. And that was wonderful, wonderful to hear. And the, yet the White House has space constraints. Um, and so we would love to, to have everyone there. Um, there will be previous evening, there will be a opening reception to kind of make a call to action and to welcome everyone from around the world. That will be a larger event. But on the day of, it will be a working ministerial. But rest assured, and I guarantee it, that native and tribal representatives will be fully represented and will be fully participating. So I have a question here from Larry Hinsman of the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. It says, uh, it seems that it will be difficult to secure specific multinational agreements during the Arctic Science Ministerial. Are there pre-meeting efforts to define specific collaborations among Arctic nations? So thank you, Larry Hinsman, for that great question. And in certain ways, it was a visit that Dr. Holdren and I and Beth Kurtula and Tammy Dickinson took to the University of Alaska at Fairbanks in August of this year that helped germinate the idea of a White House Arctic Science Ministerial. And so we're grateful for the creativity of, of Larry and Hayo Eichen and Mike Sfrega and others who are fantastic partners 
uh, in this endeavor. Absolutely, time is not on our side. But it hasn't been for a while as it pertains to the Arctic issue and climate and its impact on the global condition and what is happening and whether some of it or all of it or most of it is irreversible. We don't know. Um, but what we do know is that we have less than a year in a presidency, the president of which is, um, is personally interested on the Arctic issue has asked for updates since his visit to the Arctic. And we are going to seize the opportunity to bring together, in the near term, combinations that we hope transcend the administration and last, in the long, last into the long term. And so it's also on us. Uh, it's not just on the international community. It's on us in, in the American government and us, the American people, regarding whether we can support game-changing, catalytic efforts pertaining to observing or STEM and education in the Arctic or resilience. Um, and we certainly want to press as far forward as possible. The representations thus far that we've heard from a number of foreign governments is that we have really good partners in that regard from the Arctic area across Europe to Asia. Um, we're enthusiastic. I say the work that Martin Jeffries and Jeremy Mathis will do in June and July will be mission critical in terms of bringing together agreements and alignments. And that is what we're going to be working on very, very proactively and aggressively. Thanks. Uh, in the room, uh, let's see, over there. Hi, I'm April Melvin. I'm a AAAS Science Policy Fellow at the EPA and also a co-lead of an Arctic Change Affinity Group within the fellowship program. And I was just wondering, on the day of the ministerial, if you envision or there's any planning for side events where non-federal scientists, NGOs, and other organizations might be able to contribute to the conversation? Thanks very much, April. And also, thank you so much for the EPA support on this effort and our overall Arctic approach right now with Stan Myberg, um, Brian Muelling, Martin Dia, and your colleagues at EPA. Fantastic, fantastic um, colleagues uh, on the Arctic issue. Um, and we are, we are developing our communication strategy now for the ministerial. We've been really pleased by the reaction thus far and the support that we've gotten. It will be a working ministerial. And so we have not answered that question whether we're going to webcast or live stream the ministerial. Um, but it's whatever supports most the goal, which is that for the just after the last minute of the ministerial, we get as many and as high caliber and as productive combinations and deliverables as possible. So if it means Televising the whole thing, we'll do it. Or if it means not doing that, we'll do it that way. And that's the way we're viewing it right now. So stay tuned on that. I, I don't have more information right now for that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, could you please press the uh, button on the microphone so people can hear you online? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So my name is uh, Anita Parlow. I worked recently with the Harvard MIT Arctic Fisheries Project and rec more recently the Wilson Center uh, Project on the Polar Code. And right now I'm a Fulbright heading out um, to Arctic climbs. Great. And my question is twofold. One you uh, approach, excellent presentation, of course, uh, you, is yeah. continuity. How is that going to happen? Um, that to me, you're setting up something quite remarkable. It's been evolving, and you're sort of reaching crescendo point and focusing on science and its implications and impacts. So, how does that happen, uh, or what is your thinking um, at, at this stage? And part two, a little harder maybe, is uh, given the relationship with uh, Russia. Uh, so uh, when one is talking, for example, in the Bering area uh, uh, and talking about science and sort of fisheries and subsistence and coastal community resiliences and stuff like that, what are the cooperative uh, dimensions uh, bilaterally that uh, might be occurring? Thank you. Thank you, Anita, and thank you for all your work and focus on the Arctic issue. It's been a real pleasure working with you with the Wilson Center, and congratulations also 
on the Fulbright. First, in terms of continuity, I view that in two ways. One, what can we put on paper as committed, funded, executable combinations pertaining to Arctic science and of the ministerial, or have an alignment teed up between governments that just makes great sense that whoever is the leader of the government, it would be silly not to do it. And so part of this really relies on the experience and knowledge and, and education of the Arctic scientific community. Again, it's like I, when I started my presentation, I feel for an Arctic scientist, this is your moment. For those of us who are not Arctic scientists, we are absolutely and heartfelt in a heartfelt way in the game to bring to fruition combinations that make eminent sense on the science that you want to offer the world. And please use this opportunity to tee that up. Because it's a little bit like when I was talking about the think tank community. Great ideas don't get implemented immediately, but they do get implemented because they make too much sense not to. And if we can use this opportunity to amplify great ideas that aren't being done right now, but with broader public knowledge, would generate the support. That's what we're trying to, to that, that's the opportunity that we are trying to seize. And then more broadly, this is, an op this is in certain ways a, an era that we may be going into in which science diplomacy becomes more and more paramount to the way our globe addresses challenges and opportunity and opportunities. And this, the Arctic Science Ministerial will be exhibit A of how science diplomacy works at this moment. Again, this president feels passionately that great science knows no borders. I, I lived in Sweden for four years. And if there's anything that's the essence of the Nobel Prize in chemistry or in all the other areas, is that great science should know no borders. That's the raison d'etre for that award. And that's the raison d'etre for this ministerial. And so I, we're hoping to use science diplomacy here, obviously, and we're going to bring it to the last minute of the last day to pull together these combinations. Again, not just to have an exhibit of what we've done, but to use the ministerial on the day of to broker agreements between governments from around the world that maybe haven't gotten to yes yet, but we hope to kind of get them there if they're there in person. Um, and then to empower the mechanism and the platform of science diplomacy. That's the, my answer to your question, Anita, and thank you for it. Thank you. Um, online, we have a, a question it. from uh, Celia Martin at uh, University of Washington. It says, uh, could you discuss the uh, timeline for the production of new icebreakers? Yes, I can discuss what I know. Um, and uh, say, first of all, in certain ways, as it pertains to icebreakers, a logjam has been broken in the sense that not since the 1970s has the US government participated in the funding and the building of an icebreaker. And so we have now a promise and a, a, a request for Congress to provide $150 million to build what it will take to build new ice, a, a new heavy icebreaker. Um, but in the president's language in Alaska, the S was at the end of the word icebreaker. It's icebreakers, and that's totally pertinent to what we need. But it takes a long time to build icebreakers, and we're going to build ours in the United States, not elsewhere. Um, and that will take creating the right platform to do so. And so um, it will take an several years. We're gaming into that. Um, but at least we've broken the logjam. I also made a note of the last part of Anita's question on Russia, which I did not address when I was answering her question. And let me just say that as it pertains to Russia, Russia is culturally and socioeconomically a Arctic country like few others. And that makes sense because they own half the Arctic coastline and but also see themselves and identify themselves 
as an Arctic people, and their science reflects that. And the opportunity to work with, with their scientists pays dividends, fact pays dividends to the American people and to the benefit of science around the world. And the Arctic is also, in terms of our current relationship with Russia, and we have serious problems with Russia in Northern Europe and elsewhere. This is not to minimize that. Extremely problematic situation um, with setbacks to the global interest because of what's happening there. But in the Arctic, we are collaborating on science and research and see that as an incredible opportunity and look forward to collaborating with them on this. And I think that with their help, we'll produce a better, better result. So that's my answer on Russia. Thank you. Um, any other questions in the room here? OK, I have another one online then. Um, and this is from Ann Garland uh, from the uh, Arctic Risk Management Network. And she asks, uh, would uh, an Arctic Risk Management Network uh, um, be applicable for the ministerial as a uh, topic of discussion? I would like to hear more about what she means by that, an Arctic Risk, risk Management Network. Um, but uh, it's, to me, um, we are welcoming um, through our solicitation program um, that you'll see on the Arctic Executive Steering Committee website when we're going to put out a call for ideas and call for proposals and calls for participation, that we would welcome her idea and everyone else's. Again, this is an opportunity to lean forward, to be innovative, to be, to be creative, and let's seize the interest that your government, we work for you, have on the Arctic and to advance combinations with people elsewhere in the world. Go ahead. I think you referenced, yeah. this is Linda Preby again. Hey, Linda. Um, you referenced that there would be a meeting on June 14th. Is that of the, it was on your slide as well, a collaborative meeting? Was that the Executive Steering Committee? The, I'm just trying to think of the June 14th. Pardon me? Oh. Oh, it was, oh, okay, so you have an event. Yeah, right? sorry, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, okay, um, yeah. Thank you. Linda, you're getting me worried because you're talking about locals on the Arctic Executive Steering Committee and then meetings. I, I know I'm tired, but <laughs> maybe I'm missing a lot. No, but th thank you, Linda, for those two good questions, actually. Yep, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions that anybody has? Yes. A uh, very small question. Uh, your committee, or Igor Appel, LLC. Uh, your committee created is under Office of Science and Technology. And uh, who is responsible for coordination of federal agencies? Your committee or that Office of Technology? You couldn't be responsible both for scientific research in Arctic. Right. Well, the, the, the starting point The White House has a key problem, and there are different components within the White House, including the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, but also the Office of Science and Technology. And it's been interesting over the years to see how the Office of Science and Technology has grown as policy pertaining to science um, has evolved and also grown. When I served on the National Security Council under President Clinton, the Office of Science and Technology I think, was 30 or so scientists. Today, under Dr. Holdren, 140 scientists work at the White House. And it's under his leadership that science policy across the federal family, which is you know, a huge amount of resources and engagement and manpower um, and money, um, is employed at the Arctic Executive Steering Committee operates under his leadership. The Arctic Executive Steering Committee is the focal point of the interagency of Arctic policy across the range of Arctic issues, ranging from, of course, Arctic science, but also native and tribal health, shipping and maritime, energy, the international, and so forth. OK. Um, I think that, uh, that's probably about all that we have time for. But let's uh, thank uh, Mark again for such a fantastic presentation and discussion. Thank you very much. Absolutely.
And um, just to uh, wrap up, then, I uh, <clears throat> wanted to uh, thank everyone for uh, attending today's seminar and remind you about our upcoming events. On uh, June 14th, this is the event you're referring to, um, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, a uh, good partner of ARCUS and I know a good partner of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, will be hosting a webinar on uh, funding effective interdisciplinary collaborations using the next generation ecosystem experiment as a case study. And then after the uh, summer off for field season, we'll resume our seminar series on September 13th with a presentation on some fascinating dimensions of Arctic social science from Dr. Henry Huntington. And then on October 26th, we'll be hosting Dr. George Divicky, fresh back from his studies on Barter Island of Arctic ecological change. So I hope that you can join us for all of these events. You can check them out on the website. Um, I'll remind everybody that we would love to add you as a member of ARCUS, so uh, please uh, fill out the membership application and join us. And finally, please return your evaluation survey that you received when you came in and return it to the registration desk. If you're online, in a moment the uh, screen will show a, a short survey that you can take. Um, and we really do value your uh, responses to these to be able to improve the seminar series for everybody, both face-to-face uh, -face and online, and make them even more valuable to you. And so with that, thank you very much for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.